angels long to look into these things. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thanks, Tim, and thanks for playing guitar today, and thanks to Nick for turning up and doing music for us throughout these, uh, s- this season, along with uh, everyone else who served in those ways and served from home and contributed videos. Uh, it's been a long 18 weeks, um, and we'll limp together to the end of the year, but um, we're very thankful for the way God provides for us as a church family. Let's pray. We're jumping into a new series. We're going to pray together as we look at 1 Peter chapter 1. And uh, this prayer from our prayer book that Christians have been praying as they read God's Word for hundreds of years, I think is a great theme prayer for this series. So let's pray and then we'll jump into it together. Faithful God, You caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Enable us to read, mark, learn and inwardly digest them so that encouraged and supported by your word, we may embrace and always hold firmly onto the joyful hope of everlasting life which you have given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, has anyone ever said to you, are you sitting down? I had a a chuckle this week at a joke from comedian Brian Reagan talking about that question. Are you sitting down? It usually precedes some kind of shocking or big news, right? And Brian's joke was, have you ever actually fainted hearing shocking news? I know for me, I I never have. I'm sure it's happened, but for me, every time I've ever fainted, it hasn't been in shocking, but rather very ordinary circumstances. Kind of ordinary. I was singing in a choir in 1991. We were singing Any Dream Will Do. And uh, we were singing it for shoppers at Penrith Plaza. And bang, out I went. Another time, I stood up too quickly, not very shocking, not very spectacular, but bang, out I went. It seems that that happens for soldiers a little bit too, from my observation. Uh, They're okay tackling battle drills and weapons and jumping out of planes and actual war zones, and yet the fainting generally happens when they're standing on parade, right? Well, what's this got to do with 1 Peter? I think Peter is writing this letter that we have in front of us to a collection of first century Christians and he writes it in order that they would stand firm, that they would know the true grace of God, chapter 5, verse 12, and they would stand fast in it, they would stand firm in it. And they need to know the true grace of God to stand firm in it because they're experiencing the kind of suffering that can really knock you off your faith rather than knock you off your feet. The kind of suffering that can rattle and confuse you, it can knock you down and it can just wear you out. It's not the kind of suffering that we associate maybe with other parts of the world where you might be beaten, where your your life might be threatened or you might be imprisoned. That kind of serious suffering though that definitely happens for Christians around the world, as we know. But the kind of suffering Peter is addressing in this letter to these Christians and to you and me is the kind of suffering that we face in uh, in Australia for being Christians. Not many of us have our lives threatened, not many of us will uh, be imprisoned, Not many of us face significant financial deficit for being a Christian. But we do live in a culture where Christianity is becoming stranger and stranger. And so the churches Peter writes to in many ways are like us. Not the kind of suffering that comes from battle, but the kind of suffering that does come from waiting for Jesus to return. 
not the suffering that is as bad as it could be, but the kind of suffering that makes everyday life and relationships strained and stressful. And so as Peter outlines the great realities of who Jesus is and what he has done and what he's given his people and how they should now live, each section as he celebrates the gospel and points you to Jesus and the amazing life and hope that he gives, he then follows that up with the, with the reality of suffering and grief in the Christian life. You're accused of doing wrong even as you seek to do the good that Jesus commands. You're insulted and spoken ill of, even as you seek to share the good news of Jesus with those around you. You're marginalised and excluded for what you believe and because you won't join in, even as you seek to love people deeply. And so the question for these first century Christians, much like ourselves today, is not really that kind of, are you willing to die for your faith? But actually, are you willing to live for your faith and live out your faith, even under pressure and stress and grief? And so, the next nine weeks in these five chapters, we're going to see the true grace of God for Christians to stand firm in. It is as the great old hymn says and as that slide says, it will be strength for today and hope for tomorrow. And so as we dig into this first little bit this morning, we want us to see three things. We want to see that the most secure identity gives you a living hope that will rejoice even in suffering. So all the big themes of the letter are right here in the introduction from the Apostle Peter. And he starts with the most secure identity. Pick it up with me at uh, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia. Uh, Peter's readers are scattered throughout what we know of, uh, we know today as Turkey. And so on this map that you can see, uh, you can see that the provinces taking up that land between the Black and Mediterranean Seas. And while that's where they are, it's not where they belong, both physically and spiritually. Uh, It's thought that perhaps some of these Christians have been uh, kicked out of Rome for believing in Jesus And whether or not that's true, the spiritual reality, the theological reality, does remain true. That wherever they're living as Christians in this world, wherever we're living as Christians in this world, we are exiles, strangers, with a citizenship that is not in this world, but is in heaven, as he will say in chapter 4. In chapter 2, he calls these Christians foreigners. And those terms should kind of ring some Bible bells for us, especially if you were here when we were looking at the story of Abraham earlier in the year from Genesis 1 to 12. Abraham and Sarah, like these Christians, were called strangers in the land. And the nation of Israel were known as exiles when they were in Babylon. A long way from home, waiting to be restored, struggling to find how they fit in this world, even as they long for the world that is to come. And this is meant to be a comfort, it is meant to be a reassurance for those first century Christians. They're part of a very long story, a deep and big story of God's dealing with His people, feeling like a stranger, living as an exile, clashing with the culture around you in big and in small ways, well, that is not a new thing. While the culture around them might regard them as strange, their situation is very familiar for the people of God. 
misfits because they worship God, marginalised because they love Jesus. And while that's a deep connection for them in the history of God's people, it's made even richer, as Peter will be at pains to explain throughout this letter, not just, not just because of its connection to the Old Testament people of God, but because of its connection to Jesus himself, that he was the one who was far from home, that he was the one who had no place to call his own, that he was the one who wandered as a misfit on the margins, who was rejected and mistreated, even as he loved with joy and peace and hope. And it's the footsteps of Jesus that we follow in as Christians, who long for our home in heaven, who feel marginalised and misfitting in this world. And so while an identity as exiles and strangers in the world might feel precarious and insecure, not belonging far from home, Peter makes a deep contrast with their identity as exiles by calling them God's elect. That is not precarious and that is not uncertain. That is the most secure identity anyone can ever have. That identity couldn't be any more secure because it's not grounded in their cleverness, it's not the product of their achievements, it's not dependent upon their effort. They are God's elect, chosen to belong to God himself all because of his united Trinitarian work as Father, Son and Spirit. They are elect exiles, verse 2, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, in order to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. That is the great comfort and reassurance and security for Peter's readers then and now. Because it's a reminder that the presence of stress and, and suffering doesn't mean that God has forgotten you. Your identity in Him is secure because it's grounded in His sovereign knowledge and His gracious choice. And when the Bible speaks about God choosing people to belong to Him, it doesn't speak about Him choosing them after he sees how good they are or what they're like, he chooses people to belong to him before the creation of the world. It's not performance, it's not achievement, it's the true grace of a sovereign God. And those he chooses, God sanctifies by his spirit. He sets them apart to belong to him. How does that happen? By the spirit? Well, the verses that we won't really get to is verses 10 to 12 that remind us of the great privileged position that we and these first century readers are in. A a more privileged position than the prophets, a more privileged position than the angels. As God's Spirit takes God's promises and applies them to the hearts of His chosen people as His Word is proclaimed. And it's by the proclamation of his word and the application of that word to the hearts of people by God's spirit that gives them new birth, a fresh start as God's holy and loved people. And Peter goes on, just as Moses sprinkled God's saved people at Mount Sinai with the blood of the bull, spiritually speaking, God's saved people have been sprinkled by the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins, to mark them out as his obedient children who will live out the realities of his grace every day. Peter's repeated theme, his appeal, his call to God's people throughout this letter will be one of obedience and holiness. Be separate, be different, be different. 
obey Jesus as his loved and chosen people. As his spirit makes you holy and sanctifies you, so be holy by obeying Jesus. And so the precarious and insecure identity of God's people, as they have been throughout history, strangers and exiles, after the pattern of Jesus, displaced and marginalised, what they have in the salvation of God, the Father, Son and Spirit, is the most secure of identities that overrules all their circumstances. And so that most secure identity gives you a living hope. Have a look at verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of that salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So their citizenship is in heaven. They're waiting for Jesus to return. And until he returns, until that salvation comes in all of its fullness, they are shielded by God's power, protected by him as they trust in his promises, as they trust in his grace. But it's not simply a future reality. The hope that God's people have, which is so much deeper and richer than just optimistic positivity, it's not just cross your fingers and hope for the best, it's not wishful thinking. The hope that God's people have of an incredibly bright and perfected future with Jesus in heaven, well, that hope is living. That hope is is boots on the ground now kind of hope. The kind of hope that shapes and drives and animates the Christian life of obedience to Jesus while we wait for him to return. Here you have new birth into a new family. For these Christians, like many throughout history who are possibly kicked out of their home, who are sent to the fringes of society because they are trusting in Jesus and seem strange in their customs and behaviour because they live lives of obedience to Him, feeling dispossessed and disenfranchised, what future do you have? with Jesus it's a rock solid future it's an unspeakable reward and the reason it's rock solid and the reason it's not just optimism and the reason it's not just wishful thinking or closing your eyes and ignoring your circumstances it's rock solid living certain hope in Jesus because he has been raised from the dead It reminds you, doesn't it, of Jesus' words at the tomb of his friend Lazarus when he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never really die. It's a hope that is living and that cannot be snatched away that cannot be snuffed out, a hope that cannot be disappointed even by death. So secure it is by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. For these first century Christians, feeling mocked because they believe in him, feeling ridiculed because they worship Jesus, feeling left out because they live differently, obeying Him, feeling disadvantaged 
because I've lost property and inheritance for being a Christian and standing firm in God's grace? What's Peter's message to a Christian feeling mocked, ridiculed, left out and disadvantaged? Your future is incredibly bright. And your inheritance in the kingdom of light can never perish. It can never spoil. It will never fade for all eternity. And that kind of hope, well, that means that you will rejoice even in suffering. Have a look at verse 6. In all of this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which does perish, unlike your hope, even though refined by fire, may result in praise and glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Given their secure identity and the wonderful living hope that Jesus gives... Peter, it seems, still needs to state the obvious. You should rejoice in this. This is good news. Why does he have to say what should be obvious, that this is good, that this is rejoice-worthy news? Well, it's because of their present suffering, their grief in all kinds of trials, being alienated in their relationships and marginalised in their society and dishonoured and spoken ill of by those around them. The reminder is that God is at work even in those circumstances, refining your, your faith, showing it to be genuine, proving it to be true. <coughs> the picture of gold is that the gold is put into a ridiculously hot furnace to burn off all the dirty bits, to get rid of the bits that don't belong, the impurities. And it's that picture that that Peter gives of what is happening to your faith as you walk trusting Jesus through suffering and trials. God uses it to strengthen you, to strengthen your faith, to show it to be genuine, by saying continually as you walk through these these trials where they're saying that Jesus isn't worth it, that the Christian life is silly, that your trust in him is futile, that his promises aren't true, that he is not worth it. As you stand up and stand firm and keep walking, trusting Jesus shielded by God's power until the coming of that salvation. Your faith is shown to be genuine as you continue to say, no, Jesus is worth it. No, his promises are true. No, obedience to him is good. No, my future is incredibly bright. Peter's encouragement to these first century Christians and to you and to me this morning, as it will be for the next eight weeks, is that your most secure identity as God's chosen and dearly loved people gives you a living hope that is rock solid and certain, that enables the Christian to rejoice even in the midst of suffering knowing that Jesus is totally worth it. 
we picked that hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, to be kind of that theme song for our series with those words, strength for today, hope for tomorrow. And as I kind of was thinking about that hymn and the kind of suffering that um, Peter is addressing in this letter, I think it goes together. You know, we have so many of those great old hymns that were written in like extreme circumstances. Horatio Spafford writing, It is well with my soul after losing everything. Augustus Toplady writing, Rock of Ages while he's trapped in a storm. Well, Thomas Chisholm wrote, Great is thy faithfulness. Just sitting in a cabin in Kentucky. He was a school teacher and an insurance salesman. It's not extreme circumstances, not extraordinary circumstances. An everyday Christian who finished his days in a nursing home, but who treasured God's faithfulness every day and the living hope that Jesus brings. and persevered to the very end, not just through the dramatic and miraculous, but because of a confident hope that enabled him to walk through the ordinary circumstances of life, trusting in the triumphant achievement of Jesus' resurrection that grants an inheritance and a hope that can never perish, spoil or fade and will never be disappointed, no matter what you face in this life. With that identity and that hope, 